Okay, so good morning, everyone. It's six o one. Maybe we'll wait a um, couple more minutes. So, and again, uh, today's session after today's session. So we covered the fundamentals of CNN last time. Uh, there was enough to now go over any CNN and um, understand it. And that's what we will do today. So we're gonna cover a few and we'll also do the, um, the hands-on coding of them. And if there are new ones, which they come out all the time, you should be, you should be comfortable enough to understand any architecture. So that's the goal. So maybe we'll just wait a minute or two and then we can get started. Uh, so again, where we left off, we, uh, we pretty much, we did Lunette last time. And again, we're just following. So again, how this is a study group, right? So like, we're just uh, following the deep dive into, uh, dive into deep learning. So I'm also trying to follow that that format. So like now after Lonet, we're gonna go through AlexNet and so forth until ResNet and DenseNet and so forth. Okay, so I guess we can go ahead and get started, and we will do a small recap in the beginning, and we'll do a um, few recaps all the way through. Okay, so um, okay, let's just recap what we talked about. Uh, I have another recap slide, but let's just um, talk about uh, computer vision and CNNs uh, before um, and computer vision before before even CNNs. What we talked about was computer vision was really more about feature engineering. So, for example, even if you wanted to do like edge detection, like so, for example, now after what we saw last time, we gave an example of how we can use uh, CNNs to detect edges. But back, um, back all that was actually manually done. So, and again, we saw how like Lynette was in the 90s, but then it kind of it fell out, like there was no, no hype going on, nothing came out like on the early 2000s for a few reasons that we're gonna talk about primarily, the data sets, weren't there the right data sets and hardware and then they came back after primarily with ImageNet. Okay so let's get started. So this first slide uh, we saw it already right and then pretty much here uh, so this is kind of like the end so I just picked up like the last kind of slide and then uh, we'll go into depth. So pretty much this is um, the Eminist a data set that we applied our Lunet on. And then what we talked about, uh, what are these? These are feature maps. So these they would extract like the, what we call them the low level features, like maybe edges and so forth, and then, and so forth. And then until we get our here, until we get, we classify and then we say, for example, here, which number is it from the 10 numbers? For example, MNIST, right? We're classifying from zero to nine. So, um, so every, after every conv layer, we extract features and to, to get to, um, to our final results. Okay, so uh, then what I wanted to share is, um, there is, by the way, um, there is a nice paper let me just take that. There is a nice paper where uh, I took this visualization from and what they did, they tried to visualize the features that they were getting throughout the layers. And um, you see how we talked on the last slide about the edges? So it's kind of like same thing. So you can think of it that on the first layers, we extract edges, colors and so forth and then on the following layers, it's more complex structures like you see here. And here what they try to do, they just try to kind of like match, oh, they said, oh, okay, these features, they match this kind of images and so forth. 
and then on the much higher levels, then we, we, we extract like the feature maps is just like an aggregation of different features together. Okay, so, um, okay, so now let's get into it. So we talked about uh, computer vision was more feature engineering. You see like how right now what we did, we were, we were feeding pixels directly into our network. So that was never the case. Like people would never kind of like feed just raw pixels into their into their networks. They would they would they would process them a little bit. They would try to get something from them, just like if you're doing traditional machine learning. And then from that, then they would just feed it into something. For example, back then SVMs, support vector machines, were the ones that were working very well until. Uh, until convolutional layer um, co uh, convenient kind of like um, around 2012 this when but yeah so 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 the breakthrough was uh, because of two things primarily the data sets and okay so let's talk about the data sets it's not like there wasn't data sets back then there was this very popular actually um, uh, repo that's still there uh, right now. It's called UCI. It's I believe from um, I believe maybe it's Berkeley or but if you just Google UCI datasets, it's a good actually. It's a good collection of many datasets that um, uh, they, they range from from healthcare to to just random images and so forth. So there were those, but the quality of images wasn't great and there were um so it and so it's there weren't the best images so the data sets overall weren't the best so this one thing primarily data sets and that's when ImageNet came so ImageNet came from stanford so they said you know what why not let why not make this big data sets and then challenge all these researchers whoever gonna classify this thousand for example this this thousand classes right and so forth and, and so they scraped images from the web and then they used this mechanical Turk of Amazon where you pay uh, people to, to annotate images for you. And so there was a lot of effort from, uh, from the staff at Stanford to actually put this together, but it's something that really drove the something that was the breakthrough, that's something that drove the whole field and community. So, um, so that was great. So that was in 2010. So uh, there was in, well, the data set was released in 2009, but really the challenge when they challenged it, it started in 2010 and still uh, 2011, and we're gonna see this 2011 and 2012, it, the winners were not based still on convolutional neural networks. They were still based on just shallow, what we call them just shallow um, uh, computer vision models. And then hardware, hardware second point, and I'm gonna ask you throughout this, why, and then I'm gonna ask you the question now, and then maybe you can think of it and then we'll, we'll see, we'll talk about why later. But why, I mean, we saw it kind of in a way, why do we really need a lot of compute with deep learning? And, and, I, and I want you to have this clear, this is why and this is why. And if I say, okay, can you show me an example? You'd be like, okay, here is an example and this is why, and this is why deep learning, you really need a lot of compute. So that's another thing. Um, that's another thing. So for example, we saw, we saw MNIST, right? We were just seeing a 28 by 28 resolution images. But I mean, again, computer vision, we're talking about how about high resolution. So like now when we talk about like a much, much higher resolution images and big data sets to process all that, you definitely need a lot of compute. And we'll, and we'll do some, some fun math today with that. Okay, so I think that's good. So now before getting into the different architecture, so again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say again, the goal of today, uh, a successful session would be by you after this session, whatever, one hour and a half, two hours, you're gonna leave that you are comfortable at digesting any CNN that you will look at, that you will, that you will find online, uh, either 
uh, you know, something that, that, that was there that we didn't cover or something that is just gonna come out, okay? So that's the goal. And how we're gonna do that? We're gonna do that by covering different ones and you're gonna see, oh, okay, this is pretty much the pattern. This is pretty much how one builds on top of the other one. And then actually, not only that, it's gonna give, it's gonna give us a way of how researchers even think of ways to improve things, uh, to, to improve the, the networks. Things changed lately, like back in the day, you can get like a paper published by just, for example, just changing some, we saw pooling, okay, let's talk about this, pooling and strides and all. But back then you could, you could actually get a nice paper published by just uh, playing with this hyperparameter, let's say, you know, playing with the hyperparameters and just uh, doing some tweaks here and there. And then, and then with the data sets, you can get some good results and you can get your paper published. Now, maybe it's a little different because, uh, but yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, so what do we have here? Okay, so let's go, let's, go, let's go over this. So now when we see this, we all know what we see in this, um, in this network or this architecture, we have an input image. And then um, we apply convolutional to it. And then we talked about kernels, we talked about filters. Um, we, uh, okay, we talked about channels in, channels out, okay. Um, so we talked about the output shape size. So for example, if you are given, okay, so, and here's a question that I'm asking you, and then we're gonna go through it. But if I'm giving you an image here, and I'm, I will tell you, hey, this image is 20, um, 28 by 28 or 100 by 100. Okay, let's say this image is 100 by 100. And I'm giving you a three by three kernel. Okay, that's, that's the size of your kernel, is three by three. And maybe you do padding size of one. What does, again, padding size of one here? We see it here, meaning what? Meaning we pad to the left, we pad to the right, and we pad, and, and we pad up and down. And then if I say, okay, you have that, and you're doing a stride of two. What is your, what are you expecting as your output? What's the size? So you'd be able to do that, okay? So there's something that we saw and then we have other features and so forth. And then we call this feature maps. Okay, so we call this feature maps. So this is, this is now what we've seen very common. So we said, we're gonna take a picture, we're gonna do some conv layers here. And then at the end, we're gonna feed this to fully connected layers. And then here we just do some soft max and then we get our, um, uh, so for example, here, a multi cross entropy. So, so we get which class is it from all the different classes. Okay, uh, if, it's, uh, if it's a binary classification, it's just two classes. If it's, uh, <laughs> it's many classifications. Okay, so that, that's what we've seen. And here, what we've seen is the pattern. Um, we talked about stride is, by, is how much do we move? So we talked about pattern, how much do we pad? And again, why do we, why do we again pad? Because if we don't pad, we saw how like really the output would just shrink so fast, right? So that's the reason for padding. Strides is like the other way. It's like actually when we, in purpose, when we want to like really shrink the image uh, going down. And then what else did we saw? We saw pooling, right? And then with Lynette, uh, it had average pooling, right? But we still, but we still, because max pooling wasn't really um, applied back then or they didn't, think of it back then, but we covered both. We said, this is what max pooling is, and this is what average pooling is. And um, <clears throat> I believe we covered a few other things, but these are the core things that we're gonna uh, use from today, from that that's gonna be helpful for today's uh, session. Okay, cool. So, so far, I, I, I believe we're all in the same page. Okay. So what we're gonna cover today? So, um, as, as I said, so, okay, it was released 2009 or the challenge was in 2010. Uh, so these first two ones were not based on ConvNets. So what we're gonna cover today is 
the first winner of the challenge, AlexNet, uh, all the way through until ResNet. Actually, all the way through, even we may discuss even what comes after ResNet. There is even an, there is another session, uh, I believe uh, it's chapter 13 or so that we're gonna do, that we're gonna do together, and um, and we can even go more advanced in that. But after covering all this, all of us should be fine actually digesting again any uh, convolutional neural network. Okay, so that's the plan. So we're gonna cover that. We're gonna do. We're gonna code it. We're gonna um, this one. Okay, we'll see that, and we'll see all of them. Okay. So um, and this is and so what I tried to also do. Uh, yes, uh, we are definitely following the format of of the book. So that way, even if I miss something or if you're confused about something, I don't mention it. You can just go back and read it again. It's a book that I personally like. It's one of uh, my favorite books of, of deep learning. Uh, but I tried to show different images and diagrams of CNNs, because everyone, you'll find different papers representing it differently, you know, and so forth. So I would present here, for example, to the right or to the left, how the book have it, but I would also present a different format. So that way, however you see it, you, you, you know exactly uh, what's going on. Okay, uh, so for example, the book, they just show AlexNet like this. We should still be fine to know exactly what, what, what's, what's happening here based on what we did before. For example, we say, oh, okay, the image input size is 224 by 224. What three? Oh, okay, three channels. Okay, what do we do next? We do a uh, convolutional of kernel size 11 by 11. Oh, what's... 96, oh, 96 is our output channels. Oh, we have a stride of four and so forth. Max pooling, oh, we already covered max pooling. What's uh, the max pooling, right? There are no parameters to be learned there, but there is the window size. So this max pooling is a three by three. This max pooling has a stride of two, meaning what? Meaning it moves to Canale. It moves two strides at a time and so forth. And then, so we have 11 by 11 kernel and then the next conv layer would be five by five. Then the next would be some, again, the same one. And then the next conv layer would be three by three and so forth. What has changed, so small things has changed. For example, we can see that pad in here, they padded throughout the way differently. So for example, here you can see that they padded here by two, and then after that they padded here by one, and then uh, stride here four, then here, okay, uh, well this stride is for the conv layer, this stride two is for the max pool, and okay. Uh, but but then you may be asking, so, so based on what, based on what are they really changing this? And that is a valid question to ask, and we'll see, and we'll see, and we'll see the answer of that later. Okay, so good. And then and again, the format, how was the, the format or the structure of this, the structure of this uh, uh, networks that we saw? We had conv layers so far. Well, what did we see so far? We, we saw only Lunet. Lunet had conv layers, and then it was followed by fully connected layers. And these, I believe by now, after, after you have uh, went through the MLP chapter and all, you're all masters of this, of this one, okay? The fully connected, connected one. Uh, here, there is, there is nothing much going on here on the fully connected. They're just all, as the name says it, fully connected, okay? But what's different is here, there is a step between here and the here, which again, on, when we code, we call it like we flatten we flatten our 2D uh, to be 1D. And then we change uh, here, for example, we just kept the, size, the same size. And then here we change it to one, it's 1,000. Why here, for example, 1,000? Because again, this was for the ImageNet challenge. The ImageNet challenge, they were trying to predict 1,000 different classes. Okay, perfect. So, so now, now we know that, but let's see, you will see different uh, uh, structures. So for example, now you're gonna see something like this. Uh, uh, just in maybe in less than a minute, uh, this should also, 
uh, we'll go over it and it should also make sense. So for example, what do we have here? We have the size, okay, 227 by 227. We have the kernel 11 by 11, okay. We have three, which is representing here the depth, the number of channels, three, okay. Now uh, here we, we apply our conv layer, uh, which is again, you see that conv layer of kernel 11 by 11 is here. And then we have the stride, what do we get? Uh, we get 55 by 55. And then here we have a depth of 96. So now I'll ask you, where did this 96 come from? So this 96, for it to be here, that means actually our kernel had to have 96 filters within it. I mean, it, it had to have, well, the filters actually, the filters of the conv layers have to, um, to be the same as the input channels. So actually, for example, um, and that's the thing, sometimes, so, so don't be confused with kernels and filters. So uh, because even myself, sometimes I use them uh, interchangeably, but it's fine. So, but here is what we, here is what we have to, to understand. Uh, every kernel, we have an input, we have an input, say for example, three, for example, here we have RGB, three channels. For, for that kernel, it has to have three, we can call them three different, um, we can call them three different kernels. So we can actually multiply that by the, by the, the, the channels, okay? But now let's say if we want to have many channels out, so we wanna have now many channels out, so we're gonna have one. And for example, here we're gonna have 96, right? So now meaning what? Meaning we're gonna have 96 of those kernels, 96 of those kernels, which each kernel have three, okay? So we have 96 and each of those 96 have to have three, uh, here's what I'm gonna call them. I'm gonna call them, um, I think this is how I called them last time too, 96 uh, filters and every filter has three kernels, okay? Because now the inputs, so I, I believe that that's clear, okay? And that's how this 96 came, came about. And, and so forth. And then we keep going so forth. For example, here, the max pooling, three by three window, a stride by two. Um, that's again, max pooling. If, if you get asked about what is pooling, pooling is just the same as down sampling. That's pretty much either you do average pooling or you are doing max pooling. You are really just down sampling the size of your, of your, of your input, whatever input image, your, input feature map, right? We call that, we call these feature maps, right? Um, again, so feature maps, because yes, you can think of these as feature, as features what they have inside. Sometimes they're also called elements. That's also fine, okay? Okay, uh, okay, so that, that's all that there is. So now we can see how this is really, if you see something like this, this is just the same as if represented like this. So we have a conv layer here, and then we have a, a max pooling layer here. We have a conv layer, a max pooling and so forth and so forth uh, until we get here. And then what we do here, we have a six by six and a depth of 256. Okay. And then we flatten that out to get this 4,096. And then we have another fully connected layer and then we just apply soft max. Okay, um, so, so and, and I'm gonna pause for a second. I'm, please type your questions and Elvis, uh, he, he, will, he will ask me the questions and I will pause here and there. But let's do maybe this, this couple problems uh, and then I'm gonna pause right after them. So this is also a recap, but we're all, so here I want to do, I want to do a recap from what we've seen before but we're applying it to, to actually, by the way, do you see any inconsistency here? Is there something on this slide, um, which is, oh, you know? So if you may see like, and this is taken from the book, it's 200, 
by 20, 200, uh, uh, 224 by 224, but here 227, to, uh, 227 by 227. So which one is the right input image? So, um, so how about then if I tell you, you can, you can tell me, you know, you can tell me which one. Okay, how, how can, if I tell you, hey, how about for this, assuming that this is the correct output size, this 50 si 55 is the correct output, now just go back backwards, which one is it? Okay, so, so, so just do that and you will know. And, and actually you can go online and so the paper, actually the, the AlexNet paper, this is exactly what they had, they had 224, uh, but there were, things brought up about this 227 some said that the paper did not have the correct input size but now i can let you figure that out okay okay so um so let's do let, let's do a problem now um and we're only gonna now do this calculation for one layer for one conv layer and if we are able to do this for one conv layer we can do this for any any conv layer no matter the stripes, no matter the pattern, no, no, no matter what the kernel size is. Okay, so again, we're gonna go with the 227 here, okay? And then we have three channels because it's RGB. And then we say we have 64 filters and our kernel size is 11 by 11, okay. So I'm gonna pause again here. I'm just gonna repeat what I just said a second ago. We have 64 filters and our kernel size is 11 by 11. Okay, that means for us, it's for us to do, to be able to multiply, to do our convolutional, uh, convolutional, we have to have three of these kernels. We have to have three of them. So that way we can multiply them with our channels in. Okay, good. And how many times you're gonna do that? We're gonna do that 60 for all the 64 filters. And then we have our stride four and our pattern two. If, if I were to ask you, what is your expected channel number of your channels out? Okay, you're gonna say, oh, this is easy. You have 64 filters, it's 64. Okay, that's correct, 64. How about the output size of your um, height and width? How can you actually get that? The output now size of your expected feature map height and width. That's when, remember this equation that we saw, okay? You remember this, I think we saw it at the very end. We take this, this is our size, input size plus two times the pad and minus the size of the kernel. So for example, here it would be 64 plus four. So 68 minus 11. So 57 over four plus one, anyways, I hope I did that correct, but that's how we, we, we get it, okay? Um, uh, so input size, so what's the input size here? What's the input size? It's, the, it's 227. So if you do 227 plus that, 227 plus uh, four, which is coming from the pad end minus K, the 11 kernel over the stride plus one, you should get 56. Okay, good. Now that we don't, uh, so this is just a recap. Um, if I were to ask you, okay, so now we have this, we have this, um, I don't know if you are looking at my face, but sometimes I just, you don't have to. If it's distracting to, for you, don't. But sometimes I just, uh, uh, I just uh, move uh, with my uh, with my fingers. So let's say, for example, we have this feature map, right? And this feature map now uh, have this size of 56, 56, and there are 64, 64 output channels. If I were to ask you, what's the memory? How much memory do we need to store this? Uh, so that's something that we did not cover, but it's something uh, good to know. Good to know because all the networks that we're going to see today, but they tried, some of them, what they tried to do, they tried to be, of course, efficient, efficient in the compute. And that's how they come up with different architectures. So it is good to know how much memory is this taken. Okay, so let's see that. 
So, um, so how much memory is this output for us? How much memory do we need to store this output? Okay, our output is 56 by 56. So we have to multiply that times 64, that's all, okay? So that's the number of elements. You remember I said elements or features, call them wherever you like, because there is a feature map that has features. You can call them elements, that's also correct. So we have 200,000 of them. Let's assume that we are working with a 32-bit floating point. Okay, so a 32-bit floating point, meaning to store one element, to store one element, we need 32-bit, right? And maybe this is just going to, uh, to our basics of just bit and byte. One byte is eight bits. So for example, for a 32-bit, we just need four bytes, okay? So we need four bytes to store one element, meaning here we need four bytes times this 200. That's how many bytes we need. If I, and then if I, and if we're asked how many kilobytes, then we just divide by 10 to the power three. This is the same if you divide by 1,000 or, uh, or uh, uh, 1,024. This 1,024 just comes from, uh, from two to the power, uh, two to the power, uh, eight or 10 to the power, um, uh, anyways, you, you do the math. But anyways, the, the right one is uh, 1,024, but it's same as 1,000. So that gives us, um, because this is this is actually in, in, in memory and compute, this is how it is. So this is actually the, the, the right one. But you know, usually we just say, when we say it, uh, uh, kilobytes is just 1,000, we say gigabytes, you know, it's just 10 to the power three, 10 to the power six and so forth. Um, so, okay, so this is how, how much memory we need to store that. Uh, now, if you're asked how many parameters, and this is also very important, uh, you know how, how last time we talked about different convolutions and which one maybe you wanna use, maybe you get to a point, you say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm planning on, on, using, uh, on using all this for, um, for edge devices. So you definitely wanna, wanna know how many parameters. So for example, how many parameters here? Um, uh, it's, it's just the calculation that we mentioned earlier. So we just, we have that kernel 11 by 11, we have three channels, but we need to do that for all the 64 filters, right? So that's the number of weights that we are learning, right? Hyperparameters, parameters. So these, these are the, the weights that we are learning. Where does these weights, they are, where do they go? They go inside our kernels. And if you wanna visualize them, they go inside the kernels. Perfect, so that's the weights. And we have weights and biases, right? Every filter would have one bias. So now we'll just add this to that. And these are our learnable parameters for only this specific conv layer one. Perfect, so now this is what we know, this is our to uh, 23,000 is our learnable parameters. Um, okay, uh, this is the last one. <laughs> this is the last question, but uh, so, so now, because what we're trying to get to, we're trying to get to how much compute, right? And um, so how many operations then? How many, okay, so now, so now we know uh, the memory here, what did we say? The memory to store our output side, uh, output, right? The output from the comp layer. Good, that's our memory to store that. The number of parameters that we need to learn. So how much operations did we do? Did we just do in that one comp layer? I mean, again, we just did the 11 by 11 times that three, uh, because we had three input channels, right? And we had to do that for 64 filters. So just the same one, but we had to do that to fill in every feature, right? We had to do that to fill in every feature of our output size. This must be our output size. And you see how it is 56. So all this, those are the number of operations. Uh, here, here we are, you may be wondering where's the bias? Yes, uh, we actually, we certainly can add the bias here. But then, then where would you add the bias? Actually, uh, you would add the bias right here. So it's gonna be 11 times 11 times three plus one, plus one of the bias 
times all that. But you know, one uh, is it's it's not much. Uh, you know, it's just going to increase this by a bit. But here you see what we get: seventy-two million. Okay, so seventy-two million operations. Okay, so I'm going to pause this. So seventy-two million operations, and this is sometimes when. Uh, so that's for one count of layer. Uh, one count of layer, for example, here it has 23,000 23, parameters, and it has uh, and it's doing 72 million operations. Um, and this is okay. Uh, and you often hear, in, in, you know, when we talk about GPUs and all that, we often talk about flops. Uh, and flops are exactly this: the floating point operations per second. This GPU that you're trying to buy, how many floating point operations per second can it do? You know, like, so for example, it's, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I don't know how much background everyone is coming from, so I'm just sharing this and, and, and excuse me if this is, uh, if this is just, uh, you know, uh, just uh, basic, basic stuff. But, you know, there is like, for example, CPU for the clock cycle, we say how many hertz, for, for GPUs, we say how many flops, and it is, for example, it is a, a measure of the compute's performance. Okay, okay. Next, so so okay, perfect. So now we did all that. Now, uh, okay, this table is filled out for you. Now I want you to notice something. I want you to take a second and look at this table. Look at especially here the things that we calculated, and try to notice something. Ooh. Uh, especially from, okay, the hint if, if we are comparing the conv layers with the fully connected layers. Can you, can you compare like, you, you, what, what do you see there? You, you, what we see is, we see that the conv layers, we, they have a lot more parameters, right? Because they're fully connected, a lot more parameters, but they don't really have a lot of operations. And that is very important to understand that. While even if the conv layers, they have less parameters, they're very heavy in computation. Okay? And, and then something, okay, perfect. And this is the only thing that I wanted to mention uh, moving forward because we just want to remember this throughout our work because again, for us to have fast training and all that, this is what matters. We want, we want to have the least number of operation, but still getting the best accuracy, the best performance metric, whatever performance metric you're, you're going for. Okay, good. So um, the last thing before I pause, I wanna, I wanna share here, um, and these are things that weren't necessarily shared on the book, but I feel like these just kind of extra things, just they help solidify everything, put everything together. Um, so good. So AlexNet, uh, AlexNet uh, had many uh, had many things that, that, for example, we saw um, we saw how it had more kind of layers than Leonet. That's that's for example one, and um, uh, it had what what else? I mean, we can go back, and for example, here we can just see if we if we remember Leonet, Leonet. Um, so for example, here they used 11 by 11, a much bigger kernel size than before. But why, why, why did they use this much bigger kernel size? Because of course here, the, the images are bigger, right? Than before MNS, they were dealing with only 28 by 28. So here they needed to. So, and one of the things that um, AlexNet introduced that was significant is the way how, how Ilias and Alex, they, they implemented it. So they realized exactly what we just seen. And they realized, they said, hey, you know, there are 62 million parameters, okay? And there is 1 billion computation, right? And they found out that most of the parameters are coming from, from where? Most of the parameters are coming from the fully connected, la from the fully connected uh, layers. But most of the computation is coming from where? It's coming from the convolutional layers. And this was actually their motive of they split it into this two um, NVIDIA, NVIDIA GeForce uh, GPUs back then only three gigs of VRAM. But it definitely, it was, 
it 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 was it was a good a very good um iteration and breakthrough okay and that that other papers build upon um okay so um so and and here by the way here so based on that based on the uh, on this they they publish another paper that you can check out that, that I, I have the link here for okay uh but this is how it was implemented and if you want to even look into the details you will see that how all of these they were and again a, a different maybe structure that we did not see before but you see it you understand it there is nothing here that we say, oh, okay, it's just the input 11 by 11 kernels. Oh, okay, you just said that they split it into two. So there will be another, there will be a convolution go on here. There will be a convolution go on here. These are connected to this, that's fine. These are connected to this. These are connected to this. These are connected to this. But this GPU here, whatever is in it is also connected to the other GPU. And then here it's also connected. This is the only tr tricky part that they, that they did here and so forth. Uh, and so forth, this one would be connected here, that one would be connected there and so forth. And these, they're all connected together. Um, and now well, let's just go and just look at um, uh, the, the, the implementation for AlexNet. Uh, are there any questions, Elvis? Let me check, as some of them were answered already, but let me check if anyone has any new questions. Uh, there was just some questions about how you decide, you know, why would you want to put padding? Um, is there a specific reason why you use padding? Is it, is it for a specific set of data or something like that? I think someone gave a really good answer already for that. Um, let's see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can move forward, I think. Okay. If anyone has any questions, let me know, okay? And I will try to ask something. Thank you, Elvis. So, so, uh, so, so here, we're going through uh, the book, PyTorch implementation of AlexNet. Um, and again, the book does a good job with the comments and the description. So if I do skim through all the code fast, um, just, just you, know, you can ask, uh, or even if you don't get a chance to ask, you can go through the book, okay? So again, we're just building the network that we just seen. Um, so again, here, what we have, we just specify the kernel size, we specify the stride, we specify the padding, uh, we specify our output uh, number, uh, output uh, number of uh, channels output, and and pretty much that's all. And then here we follow it by ReLU, and that's actually that's another good point here. AlexNet is the first time that ReLU was introduced is in AlexNet, and um, and here. And here, I'm not going to cover uh, activation functions. I believe you've already, Elvis, maybe you've already covered them. Uh, but but um, understand uh, why, for example, real U is used over sigmoid and mainly the concepts of vanishing gradients and exploding gradients have that very clear this is what vanishing gradients mean, and this is what exploding gradients mean. And if you still have any doubt there, what I would suggest, I would suggest just take a simple network. It's not, it's not 2D, just one network, maybe with just like one variable, uh, and then with just like four nodes, just a small one with four nodes, and then just show how, for example, if you play around with your, um, with your sigmoid, um, uh, if you have your sigmoid, how, for example, how you would see the vanishing gradients, right? Um, but anyway, but but if we have some time, please feel free. Uh, I would I'd, I'd gladly cover that again. If uh, if but anyways, so ReLU uh, was used for the first time in AlexNet, um, and they followed it with a max pooling here, a max pooling with. Um, uh, with two by two, and that's exactly so. This is very straightforward. 
uh, uh, for Wiso. And then same thing here is repeated. Um, same thing here is repeated. Now we give it the number, the number of the channels in and then the channels out. And, um, and again, by the way, here we are applying this to our MNIST, to fashion MNIST. And that's why if you're wondering why this is not, uh, because we were working with RGV a second ago, right? But if you're wondering why it's one, because MNIST is just grayscale, right? Okay. And, and, and so forth. And then we go through that. And then at the end, we flatten it. And then we go through our fully connected uh, layers. It's good. You see, it's good that uh, we're going through the code in case I missed something. So for example, here, they used to drop out. Uh, okay. Uh, this, is also, this is also the first time, of course, because this is the, the first time that uh, CNN won a competition. So it's the first time that dropout was, was used. Um, we can talk about dropout and best practices of dropout and all, uh, of course, using dropout. Uh, dropout, okay, dropout, even if maybe uh, some of you who are using, um, who are doing already deep learning and so forth, uh, maybe dropout is not used as much nowadays, but that does not mean, that does not mean it is not an effective technique for overfitting. It is an effective technique, uh, technique for, uh, and I would not uh, classify dropout and the regularization. I would classify dropout more under like data augmentation. Okay, but it is an effective method for um, uh, to 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 handle overfitting. To handle over one of the ways to handle overfitting. But okay, so they use this here, so that's good. So just just to know that. Um, okay. And then, and then here uh, they just uh, uh, use a random sample to kind of here to just display the different sizes, which we, we have already went through. And then they do the final classification of which one is it from the 10 classes. Um, okay, and, and then here, and then here we load our fashion MNIST and then we resize it uh, 200, uh, 224 by 224 to just kind of make it work with, with AlexNet. Okay, good. And that's all. And then, and then we trained it. This is similar to what we've seen in the, in the net before. Uh, please go through this. Uh, we're going to, again, we have so many notebooks today, so we're going to see this, but if you have at any, at any time, any questions, um, let me know. So, yeah, so because we'll, we'll move forward. So, um, we have more notebooks to, to visit. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, present mode. Okay. So, uh, so takeaways. So, uh, and this is uh, so, and, and I, I didn't do these takeaways for all of the for all of the, the networks, but mainly the main ones that they have introduced so many. So, for example, here just to briefly say, okay, ReLU was used instead of sigmoid, dropout instead of weight decay. Uh, okay, here weight decay would be for regularization. So here maybe not instead, but anyway, uh, for overfitting. So here I'm talking about overfitting. Overlap, so they use this overlap pooling. What's overlap pooling is, is you do your pooling, but you see how like now when we do our max pooling or our average pooling, we just get the max or the average from that window. And then we kind of like move with some strides to the next one and then we get it. But what they did, they use overlap pooling, meaning even when you pull your next one, you, the window, it's going to overlap with the first one. And they claim that it is better for overfitting. Okay, uh, nowadays, nowadays, um, I don't see over pool, overlap pooling used much. Um, uh, max pooling is used just with, but it's maybe, uh, you know, it, it, it's possible. And then they introduce image augment data augmentation or image augmentation, just like flipping and clipping, um, which is also helpful to just for your model to generalize, 
to uh, more zoom in so we can think of the different ones. I believe we will definitely cover that augmentation in one of the chapters. Um, okay. Uh, and then here, my last comment was, uh, yes, there are other, so now we don't hear anybody using AlexNet, but it's still, it's a, it was a key step, a key step um, to, to, to move to today's networks. But, and again, if we, you understand now how AlexNet, the rest is just the same. Okay, moving forward. Now, okay, we covered AlexNet. We're gonna go to VGG. So uh, if you're wondering why we skipped here 2013, there was the architecture that won the challenge on 2013 is called ZFNet. ZFNet, they did not really introduce anything significant to what they did. All these strides and this uh, pretty much this, this pretty much the stride and the kernel size, they changed them and they also changed the number of channels, the depth, they just used deeper channels and they were able to get a better performance. That's all. So they just took Alex. So it's pretty much AlexNet um, optimized, I should say. So now let's just let's go to VG. VGNet won the 2014 challenge. So again, in purpose, not to confuse you, but to kind of just make us all familiar with anything, uh, any representation of the network that we see. Again, you see this, you say, oh, okay, it's fine. This is what this one is doing. Again, uh, to go through it, you have your RGB image, you have conv layers. And again, here, sometimes when you have anything here, we just go with it. So for example, the white blocks, meaning convolution, a conv layer followed by a real U. When we have a red one, it's just max pooling. When we have a blue one, it would be the fully connected one. And then a brown one would be a soft one. Um, so if we have these, they're helpful. Sometimes we don't, but uh, but it's fine. You can just figure figure that out. And it's also helpful sometimes when you have the sizes. So for example, here we is the 224 200 uh, RGB by three, and then here we went to 64. What does that mean here? Where did the 64 again comes? Is the number of filters. So this kernel here had again 64 so it is really then oh you can say oh we just seen that uh, a second ago with AlexNet exactly so VGG is very similar to AlexNet but uh but that's the thing so but right so but every 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 network has to introduce something so so what did VGG then introduce since I said oh it's similar to AlexNet what they introduced is they said Okay, AlexNet worked well, but it didn't really give a good modular way for researchers to follow. And what I mean by that is what they suggested, they suggested like a block, a VGG block, okay? And, and that's what we'll see on the next slide. And here you have the, the reference of the paper, um, and again, by just covering what we have covered, what we're covering, you should be very comfortable on reading even the state of the art papers back then, you know? Um, but before moving to the next slide and talk about that VGG block, let's just, uh, let's just go over, over this one. Okay, so, so to kind of, to see, okay, so we have these feature maps that, uh, oh, okay, that's, okay, when you see here this max pooling, you say, oh, okay, that's pretty much what the max pooling did. Oh, okay, it just, um, what this max pooling does, it, it down samples, right? So that's exactly how we got this 112 from the 224. Oh, okay, that's what max pooling did. Oh, well, here I have 128. So it went from 64 to 128. Oh, what happened? Oh, okay, this, this, kernel, this kernel must have 128 filters and so forth. Okay, and then you keep going, you keep going. Again, to remember all these conv layers are followed by real use and then so forth and so to move it over to our fully connected layer and then we have our soft mess. So let's talk about this. Um, so two things. So if I were to summarize with VGG added two things, the depth, since we just seen that, you can see comparing VGG to our, um, to our AlexNet. 
it's certainly deeper. You can maybe go back and then you can go back like here for a second and then you can count how many, but we're not gonna do that, but you can go back and count for Alex and it's how many, and then you can count the, the Kong layers for, for a few GGNF. So they focus on the depth and then introducing this block um, introducing this, this VGG block. Okay, so let's talk about that. So uh, what they said, they said, um, let's make this in a way more modular. And then in a way, when researchers are wor working with this, for example, they can just put blocks together instead of, okay, add a layer here, add a layer here. Um, and that's kind of and that's kind of what they did. So 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 a block would just have a convolutional layer with some padding in it, followed by a real U, and then with max pooling. That, that's all. And then you can see. So what's VGG? It's just blocks put together. And then same thing you have for the fully connected uh, network. So it, it is. Um, it, it is similar in a way to, um, it is similar. So then, the, then you're gonna say, well, it is similar how did it win the competition? Pretty much it won the competition because it's much deeper, that, that's why. And then, uh, and then these are just uh, different variants of VGG. Uh, you, for example, you've heard, maybe you may have heard of VGG 19 or 16. So these, they just represent the number of layers that, there are, that they are there. The first one that was presented is VGG 11. And that's, and that's why I showed this table here. And that's actually the, code, the, the one that we're gonna implement. The code implements is VGG 11. And uh, there are other ones. Um, okay, this is the local response normalization they added there. And, and uh, just different variations there. Okay. Hey, Salim, oh. I want to ask you a question here. Sorry for the interruption. Yes. Um, there's an interesting question here. I think interesting to have a discussion. Um, so the question is, are more complex architectures better than simpler ones? How to handle the trade-off between complex architectures and accuracy? So I think this is like an it depend question, very open question, but maybe you can share your like experience and insights here. Yeah, I, th I, th I think it's a great question that, that we all ask. So let's maybe cover, cover more. And then I hope some of that question will become clear, but it's a question that, 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 that it's gonna open the discussion at the end. So, so but we'll cover more of that, which one is, and, and, and um, yeah, um, yeah. And the one because one of the architectures they actually they they did that so a lot of a lot of these research groups what they do they go and they try to say for example to just uh, to to even add to the question they say for example well um, well there are now two things right now okay we're we're going through that there are two things we can either make our networks deep 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 even deeper deeper right. Or maybe we can maybe not have them deep, but maybe we can actually have the channels more, like more channels instead, but kind of like a shallower, let's say. So which one is better? And I think that's, that's the exact question. I'm just repeating that. So we'll, we'll see that. We'll, we'll see that in a few slides. Okay, let's, um, let's, let's do this implementation of VGG. Um, okay. Um, so the first thing is we define a VGG block, uh, and again, this VGG block, it's not like, oh, okay, um, it has to be like this, for example, actually, I'll, uh, okay, well, I said earlier, AlexNet is not used nowadays much, but uh, you but you can find actually VGG still being used in different things. So even if VGG is 2014, it's still it's still fine. So and then while I'm saying that, meaning like to go in and talking about the VGG block, feel free to modify how you would like your VGG block to be like. You want to maybe just play around with it to to test out different things. Feel free to do that. For instance, what this one have. It has a conv layer uh, followed by a ReLU. And then again, here we see it's, it's a three by three, a padding uh, one, 
and then uh, it has two parameters, the input channels and the output channels. And then uh, we feed the number, that's the thing, we feed the number of convolutional that we want to do, and that's how we iterate through all this kind of like, through all this, uh, how many times do we want to repeat the same block again and again? And you may have, and you, you may have different blocks. You can say, oh, okay, I'm gonna make a VGG block one that will have specific ones and I will have VGG like block two that is gonna have Y because maybe you're just experimenting. That's completely fine. Um, so the first block has 64 output channels Oh yes, here uh, again. Here we're getting this uh, architecture uh, specifications uh, because we are trying to follow the what's actually what VGG eleven actually implemented. So that's so. Just if you're wondering where, where did this come from, this just came from. If we maybe look at the the slide that we just uh, had a second ago, these are coming from that. So that's what the book they're trying to do. They're actually they're trying to really mimic the the, uh, the 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 architecture. And if there is anything what the book they're trying to change, they're only usually they're only trying to change the the images, either the size and so forth, to make it you know to make it fit. Uh, to, to make it uh, to, to make it work, uh, let's say for example, same as we did with Alex and the 224, or or for example, we're going to see in a second inception, it's too big. They can try to maybe make make this smaller. Okay, so that's where these they come from. Um, uh, and then here we have this function that here we go through we go through this um, this different input input output channels that's what we're going through this um uh, yeah so actually what we're going through so let's see th this one here um that would be the number of convolutional there and though and then 64 that would be the number of channels and then here that would be the number of convolutional layer and then there would be the number of channels and so forth so here and that's why here we have uh, one conv, one conv, two conv, two conv, and another two conv. So at total, we have eight convolutional layers. That's where we get here, eight convolutional layers, and then three fully connected layers, and a total of 11, and that's how it is uh, VGG 11. Okay, and that's, and, that's so, and that's what we have here, and then we just, we are just appending that to our convolutional blocks. Now, when we have appended that, we add it, so this is pretty much just uh, an identifier that's saying, okay, uh, now we're adding all those, um, and then we're just gonna flatten them. Once we flatten them, we add our fully connected network, uh, fully connected network uh, layers, and we have a dropout and a ROLU following each one. So nothing really too special, too different from what we've seen before, okay? Um, Again, here, uh, just same, the output channels times the seven by seven, that's the size that uh, we got for our output. Okay, um, and then again, that's exactly what we see here. And then uh, we, they used always the sample, which is a very good visualization. And I would even encourage you, uh, encourage all of us actually to, to, yeah, to follow this sometimes even before running our training to kind of like just double check that the sizing is what we are expecting. And that's why now we are in a good shape because we even learned how to even manually calculate the, the output time. So if something is, 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 is not looking as we want it to, we can just double check, right? Definitely, definitely. And, and, and from my personal experience, definitely it is helpful to double check the, the sizes if you are getting the right ones, you know, after, after, uh, after blocks or after few, uh, few layers. Okay, um, uh, since VGG is more uh, computational heavy, why is it more computational heavy? Just simply because of course there are more layers. We're gonna construct a network with smaller channels. So what they did, 
they went to those channels and then they divided here. So they just kept the number of conv. So this one here is taken from this tuple, the tuple of conv architecture. This one's keeping it the same. And then this one is just divided it's by this ratio, which is four. Okay, so we just divided the number of our channels by four to kind of just make it make it run and then we just run it. And then again, the learner rate, I believe we have not talked about picking the learner rate and which one is the right one. I believe that's maybe for, I believe Elvis will cover that, the learner rate schedulers and all that. But 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 here I believe it was a smaller maybe learner rate than, than AlexNet. Uh, Okay, so so that's good. So so let's let's go back um, and again takeaways um, for this one. And I can and I can I can definitely pause after this one and take take any um, any specific questions. And I would love to maybe if we have you know a few minutes at the end we can just sit and we can just talk about uh, about uh, about about yeah like well, any either best practices or or like the, the question that that's a good question uh, certainly. Okay, so takeaways, um, reusable convolutional blocks, um, which allows for an efficient design of complex networks. And, and, this, is a key, and th this is a key because you will see that the next architectures, they all in a way follow this. Now they started kind of like, oh, okay, let's just make it more blocks. You know, it's kind of like, you know, when you're coding, you have this function that, you know, that you can, in a way you can call, you can call more modular code in a way. It, it's like, you can think of it in a way, same way. And then they used smaller receptive fields. Again, um, uh, again, I may not have covered exactly what a receptive field is, but the receptive field is you can, you can think of it as a feature. How much does a feature see all the way back? What does it really represent? So, for example, if we're only take, talking about the receptive field after the first conv layer, it's only those, it's only that kernel side, the three by three or whatever. That would be the receptive field for that specific feature. But then when you go deeper, deeper, the receptive field is how much, because then it's not, because right, if you go and, and, uh, and it would be nice if you just Google like receptive field and then see how. Uh, that not for the first layer, later on how it is related. So that feature is coming from different kernels together. But anyway, that's the receptive field aside. And then here um, they use a smaller kernel pretty much compared to AlexNet, which is 11 by 11. And uh, to answer parts of that question, so authors here, they said they found several layers of deep, of deep, meaning many, many layers and neural convolutional with smaller kernel size were more effective than few layers, but wider convolutions. So here, few layers and wider convolution, meaning a bigger size. Okay, that's what they're talking about here. Talking about channels is, is another thing, but at least that's why this one answers parts of that question. Okay. Um, uh, the next one, this one, this one, it's not, it's not known as much, uh, as much, but the book have it, but it introduces one, uh, one, one good concept, which is this MLP convolutional. So, so far, okay. And again, even if the architectures, they may look different, uh, you can trust me that wh wherever we have learned so far, we can really look at and understand anything. So here, what what is this uh, MLP convolutional uh, saying? What did we what did we do before? Uh, before we just did the convolutional and then we feed it to the next layer. This one we already know what's an MLP. So actually, we do the convolutional, but then we feed it to an MLP, a multi-layer perceptron, and then to another multi-layer perceptron, and then that goes and be our feature. That's what an MLP conv is. So it replaces those linear filters with a nonlinear multilinear perceptron. And here, why is it a nonlinear? Because actually ReLU is applied to, to every step. We do the convolutional, 
we apply ReLU and then we we do the, the full connected layer. We apply ReLU and then we we do the we do the we, we send it and then again we apply ReLU and then and that's why it becomes. A, so what does it? Um, excuse me. One second. So I do have some time. I do have some. Um, um, just one second. Okay. Uh, I do sometimes have, have these small notes that they remind me if I forget uh, anything I want to talk about. So, yeah, exactly. What what they with these they uh, have an add in this nonlinearity. It it introduces um, it introduces like a complex a complex learnable. Uh, structure where we're now we're now instead of just feeding that the output directly now you have more parameters to learn right you definitely have more parameters to learn because you actually we can actually think of and this is the thing what they introduce so you see how like how we have this going to one fully connected network we can think of this and I believe we saw that last time as a one by one conv layer okay and i think we definitely seen how we can really do this into one conv layer or to a fully connected is the same as one conv layer uh so yeah so meaning what if we do that a one by one conv layer meaning we still we have to learn that one conv layer okay good and then that means there is another one one by one conv layer that we need to learn so that that, that introduces more flexibility into our network more learning uh to this and that's pretty much what this network and network they have introduced so primarily this one and then the second point that they introduce is this global average pooling and then what you, where, where you can see that here at the end they do this global average pooling um and pretty much what global average pooling is it's global so you take the whole channel so for example you have all this uh, let's say 20 channels. Every channel, you just do the pooling in the full channel. Meaning, for example, if you wanna do max pooling, that's fine. You do the max pooling in the full channel, that gives you only one, okay? And then you do it on the next channel, so you only get 20 outputs. So usually what happens, so for example, you do that all the way here, okay? Um, you do that all the way here. So for example, let's say you're classifying for 10 classes. So you would, you would actually get here, you would, the last step would be 10 output channels. You wanna actually get 10 output channels and those 10 output channels, when you're gonna do your global average pooling, they're gonna give you, uh, you can think of it as a 1D tensor of 10, 1D tensor of 10, and then you can just, for example, do a soft max and then you'll get which class that is, okay? And that's what's global average pooling is um, uh, instead of, okay, uh, yeah, that, that's good. So, um, and yeah, so this is actually to just reiterate my point. Um, I have already mentioned how the, non, the nonlinearity comes from the nonlinear activation function. And then here, the MLP conv layer has as many channels as the classes in your model. So when you do the average, the global average pool and you really it just becomes a score of each class. And then, and then, and then you can, and then from that you can just get the, 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 the class that you're looking for. Uh, we'll go, we'll go, and, and, then, and then we'll see, we'll see the, why this concept is, uh, is important. They call it also like the pre-inception thing. Um, but okay, let's let's go now into our um, what the book implemented for for this one, how they um, how they implemented this one. Okay, um, I've I've already run it, so um, so so okay. And by the way, I uh, I will okay. For example, for this one, I, I feel I never talked about these the train laws and accuracies and so forth. I believe maybe. You've already covered this, or already, but I, I, but we'll we'll talk about it for a second, maybe here. Um, 
again, what this this uh, structure or network introduced, it introduced this this uh, block, right? That takes our conv layer, and um, and it takes our conv layer, and then. Uh, yeah, so so this is so this is what we see here. So we have our conv layer followed by a ReLU, and this is the regular thing. Uh, no, nothing here, nothing here uh, is different. The kernel size here, we don't specify it here because that's gonna that's gonna come from our our call. You see, that's gonna come from, for example, here 11, 11, 11, That's what's gonna go here. But here instead, we specify that the kernel size is one, meaning we're doing a one by one convolution. And again, doing a one by one convolution is the same as if we are doing uh, feeding it to a fully connected uh, layer. And I would definitely encourage you to look at um, to look at uh, our last slides. There is a slide where it was a one by one conv. And that's pretty much all that we're doing here. So here we're connecting that to, we're feeding that to our fully connected layer, followed by a real you, uh, and then another fully connected layer followed by real you. Okay, actually I may go to that slide maybe for a minute in here. Uh, Maybe not spend too much time on it, but I'll, I'll, I'll go on that slide, and and that's all. So so now we have our our block. Um, we have our block, and then the rest is the same. I believe this ninety six to fifty six. They they mimic one of the previous examples that we just seen. Um, so and then again, they call the block here. They call it so it goes through all that. Uh, the kernel size goes to that, so it applies that. And it, it applies the stride for that, the pattern here, there is no pattern, so there is no pattern here. Um, and then, and so forth. So it does that, and then it does max pooling. And then, so I believe, so here, because I don't have which one, let me, we can, what, we, what I can do, uh, you, you're looking at my screen. Um, let's see, one second. Because I just uh, what I'm what I want to check for is, yeah, it just okay. This one. So what I'm checking for is which one they um, which one did they use? Um, which which one they 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 used for for this one? Okay. Um, Okay, so okay, so the the corresponding number of hotspots were of AlexNet. So so this is this is uh, this format the ninety six the two fifty six. They just used the same as AlexNet. Uh, so we did AlexNet VGG and then network and network. So this is back to AlexNet. Okay. Um, following up, uh, so nothing here uh, that we have not seen so far. So we have the dropout. Uh, this is what's new. So when you have this adaptive average pooling, so we're doing here global average pooling, and this is what what that is. So and that's and that's and that step, the global average pooling, um, we get that size one by ten, and then we just run it. We definitely see that the learning rate here used that they used uh, is higher than uh, than. Uh, is higher than, uh, than than the previous VGG one. Okay, and maybe here to kind of like just change a little bit, and maybe to pause and 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 to talk about the training loss and accuracy and so forth. Let, let's let's look at this one. How, how is this one doing? What do you, what do you guys uh, think? This one, this one. Okay, so uh, yeah, definitely. So two things we look at, right? The loss. Okay, so the loss starts high and then it starts to converge. Okay, it's still converging for the number of epochs. Okay, it's going good. Uh, when we look at, when we look at, um, by the way, by the way, here the the train loss is okay. It's zero point five. So sometimes you say, okay, is this is this a high loss or a or a or this or this value is it is it high or low? Um, 
Yeah, there's something to definitely pay attention on. Pay attention on what's the, what's the, the value of the loss that you're getting into. I mean, you usually want to get to even a much smaller loss, um, but that is again relevant to to the problem, the loss that you're using. Uh, and then here we have train and accuracy. You're usually you're checking for anything. Anything unusual, like maybe some, um, um, like maybe a gap, maybe a gap between the train accuracy or the test accuracy, something like that. But here, everything looks fine. Well, maybe we can see in the, in the future if, if something uh, looks there. Okay, so with that, I want to maybe just uh, show you that slide, if I have it, that I was talking about, that I, uh, it's nice to go and look at that we saw last time. I'm talking about the 101 conf. So, so yeah, so, so this is the, you, 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 uh, okay, you can see my screen, right? Okay, you, okay. Uh, Enfos, can you see multiple output channel screen, please? Yes, I can see. Perfect. Uh, so, so, this is the, so this is what I was talking about. Um, so, so again, here what we did, we did a one by one conv layer that when we apply it to, it's like applied to all the pixels in, in here on the same pixel across the channels, okay? Um, yeah, uh, and again, here we have two, uh, two channel outputs and that's why we used two filters here and, and and this is really really just the same as doing a fully connected uh, network uh, with all these kernels. Okay, let's go back. Okay, so moving moving on, uh, where are we now? We are at uh, we covered. Uh, okay, so we covered VGG and now I said pre-inception. So, and this is, so now we are at Google Net and Google Net is sometimes also called the inception net or, um, or, or inception version one, okay? And this is the book. So this is again, the book, if you're looking at the book, this is what they have. You have the, your input that goes into, into this different convolutional layers and what is different between them. What's different between them is the kernel size. You can see, and that's why I had, and that's why I just put this here to just show you what I'm talking about in the book. But let's forget about this one for a second and come here to this bottom left one. So, so this is their idea. So their idea, you may be wondering, well, exactly as um, as my fellow here he asks, he said, uh, kind of like very similar to, to that question. You may be asking why use a one by one or a three by three or which one, which one? <laughs> so, so exactly, kind of, kind of, kind of like that's what they said. They said, why not use all? Why not use all and let the training determine which one is the is is the right one to be used? Okay. Um, so the idea is, is this one. So you would have a one by one conv, you would have also a three by three conv, a five by five, and also you would have max pooling. And we'll see in a second why you also need here max pooling, because if you want to change the, the, the max pooling, usually again, it's down sampling. So it's really used when you want to maybe match, match the size. Okay, but this is, so this is the idea, and then you just concatenate this together. But this is different than what the book, of course, shows. I mean, they're, they're both correct, but this is just the naive version. But, um, and then it's important to understand why we introduced this one by one here. And that's what we're gonna see in a second. And that's actually the intuition that Google Net, they got from the network that we just seen before now, that network in network, and you see that network how in network, how they introduce a one by one conf, that's how this one kind of like built in. So, okay, so from that, let's go to this one here. 
this one is just a similar representation. All that I would like to show here, of course, if you would like to go through all the sizes, you can go. But here, primarily what I want you to, to, to see is how the output, you see here when I say filter concatenation, this is exactly how they're concatenated. So you get, now you have many, many channels. So this one, you do that, that would, for example, give you, hey, you, you're gonna get 32 channels. You're gonna get 32 channels. You're gonna get 128 output channels. You're gonna get 64 output channels. You can concatenate all of them. You have all these 256 channels that will go on to the next one. And you will say, hey, hey, this is already too many channels. Yes. And that's why there is a meme. There was a big meme uh, when this uh, when this came out that even the paper itself, they I think they cited this meme, but I think I have it in one of the slides. But anyway, so moving moving forward, that's the naive one. So why why do we really need or why did they did they put this one by one kind of here? So this is the model that has been used. So, so let's let's understand. So this is exactly the inception block. This is what they call the inception block. And please understand this one. Uh, I mean, there is not there is nothing here like crazy to understand, but just like pay attention to it because there is an inception version one, inception version two, three, and four, and they are some of the best actually architectures. And even when we're going to see later on ResNets, actually at the end, some of the newest architectures, they combined inception with ResNet. So, so let's understand why they, uh, why they use this. And what we know already uh, allow us, we already understand it. Let's just put it together. And with that, I'm asking you again, how many parameters and operations are in this? And I, and I'm gonna just pause for a few seconds and I want you to just look at it. And just from what we know, just in your mind, or if you have a paper that's even better, just say how many parameters first, just say how many parameters does this conf layer have? Okay. And then, and then how many operations does this conv layer have? If, okay, even if you are, if you are struggling with this one, if you're not, if you're not, that's, that's awesome. If you are, it's no worries. Just go back to that first slide. I'm, I'm not gonna share. I'm not gonna share uh, share it now. I will in a second. But if you are, just go back. Uh, oh, okay. You don't have my slides, so you cannot go back. But anyway, uh, well, later on when you're working, you go back to that first slide, and then we did it. So okay, let, let's do that together. So, um, how many parameters do we have here? Uh, again, what did we say about the parameters? It's about the kernel size. So we have our five by five. Uh, our five by five. So how many, how many you can think, how many convolutions do we need to do? So we have five by five times 192, because for example, for us to actually get here, this is our input channels. So this one, this kernel must have to for it to be for us to be able to do the convolution, it must have 192 kernels. Every filter, so this is again 32 filters. Every filter must have must have that. Uh, so it's going to be 32 times five by five times 192. That's the number of parameters. If you get that, awesome. If not, it's still it's still okay. I mean, it's still okay. This uh, the ne so the next thing is operations now. Operations is just that, just what we talked about that. But we're just gonna have to to really do that for every feature here. So wherever we got five times five times five times thirty two times one ninety two times that twenty eight by twenty eight. That's the number of operations. Perfect. Okay, good. And why I asked you to do that. So how about now let's do this together. So now what has changed between this, this one and what has changed between here. So the difference is now we're going to do this one by one conf with 16 filters. 
Okay, so let's see how many parameters are in here. One by one times 16 times the 192. So we have 2.4 million parameters. Okay, if we wanna, now we're gonna do five by five times 32, right? Because we, 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 want, we wanna always get, because if we're gonna compare them both, we want to have the same output channel number. If we have the 32 on the last one, we wanna have 32 here. So we have five by five times 32 times how many parameters? Five by five times 32 times 16, right? So um, 16, that's definitely, but here, what, what are they calculating? Okay, if you see them adding uh, two, 28 by 28, so they actually they calculated here the operations. If they have they have they have that, that's the operation. Um, okay, uh, so they've calculated the operation. So meaning what they've actually done, they've then they have then instead of all this, then what they did, they actually let's calculate in the operations. Okay, that's fine. Uh, okay, Let, let's calculate then the operations of the total this one. Let's compare it to the other one. I'm gonna come back again, uh, come back to the first step. What's the how many operations do we have here? We said for every 28 by 28, we have to do 28 by 28 times one by one times 16 times 192. Okay, it's 2.4. Okay, good. And now how many here do we have? We have for everyone 28 by 28 times five by five times 32 times 16. It's kind of just what we said before. I was just calculating the parameters, that's all. And now we have to add, if we add them, that's the total operations we have here. Okay, so it's 2.4 million and 10, so it's 12.4 uh, 12 million the total. If we did, okay, if we did this previous one, and maybe if you have, if you have, uh, and we can do it here together, I don't know, I have this spotlight search that appeared on my screen, I don't know if you see it, but if we actually do, uh, if we do five times five, um, <laughs> we, have, we have five times five, uh, uh, what did you say, how many? 28 by 28, right? 28 by 28, and then the 32 filters, right? 32, and then the 192, the first one, right? Okay, here it came out. It's the 120 million, okay? Anyways, I, I, I did it again slowly to kind of like, maybe if you're just working through this with me, I just want to do it. So the point here was to show you is actually doing it this way with an introducing a comp layer, it reduces the number of operations significantly. And that's the whole point. So yes, we are using a much deeper network Yes, with inception, we are, and this is again, this is the model that we're now using. It is a much deeper, but we have reduced it with what? With this uh, one by one that we are using before this. And that's the key here to understand. And again, um, as I told you, it's nice to just see different architectures. So uh, representations, I would say, and this is what the book here to the left, they have showed us. Okay, this is exactly the Google Net uh, structure. And then this is also, you would find actually the paper, I believe have this, have something very similar to this one. They are all the same. Uh, again, this is what we seen, what we seen before. And then, so this is, we can think of it again as an inception block. You see how like now everyone builds on the other one. We've talked about how VGG built on the other one and then the network and network introduced this. Well, VGG is the one that first came out with this block. They said, why not just make everything black? Good, now we made everything black. And network and network, they said, okay, you know what? Let's introduce that 101 conf. Okay, good. Now Inception came and actually it is using the same block and it is also using the one by one conf. And that's what we see here. So there is one Inception block here. You can see that the, the circles is just that one repeated. One Inceptions, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There is eight and there is a nine. So, so, so there are like, it looks like there are here, not, uh, this one, um, yeah, there's another inception. So it looks like here there are nine, okay. Uh, and yeah, here actually going, going to our, 
to, to our uh, book one is the same. So we have two, which are these two, and then they have this five and then two. So there are nine there. And then these are these first ones where they just do uh, these initial ones where, where they just do uh, a seven by seven conv. And that's what we see here, followed by max pool and followed by a conv, followed by a, another um, by a 101. And then by, so this is again, this is just, that's how they've, they've tried things. So again, for, for, for the researchers, for any researchers who publish this, uh, certainly they have tried so many variations to kind of like see which one works best looking at uh, overfitting, looking at the performance metrics and, and, and many other things. And, and then here, uh, there is another thing here that we see is this, um, what they call them as the auxiliary uh, smaller networks. And what these are, these are helpful to kind of like check that even, even you are getting, you are getting even a correct or an accurate model, even with a smaller, with a, even with a more shallow uh, model here. So like, for example, it's the same, it's the same loss and all, but this one would just have a different weight. So for example, the, it would have a 0 0.3 weight. This one would also have like a 0 0.3 weight. So a much lesser weight than this one. And this makes sure that the, 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 the system, the network, even the, 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 this, even up to here, even up to here can really generalize well, meaning the waves are well, well trained, let's say. Okay, uh, this is the meme that I was talking about that was cited in the paper. And this is why the paper is actually called that inception from that inception movie when they said we need to go deeper. And then here where I'm showing, it's the same what we saw, it's a different representation, but here where I would like you to realize that everything is modular. You can see that, for example, there is like what they call a stem, which is just the beginning of the one that we saw, the comp layers with the max pool and the comp and, and so forth. And, and there are inceptions blocks, just that same block that we defined that we're gonna now, we're gonna code this. It's gonna same as we coded before the network connect in network block, we're gonna code this one and so forth. And then, and then here when you have R is just really, so this is just a different representation that I will add all the citations and when I share, when I share the, the slides, of, of course. Um, but, but yeah, this is just a more friendly way to kind of just look at it. And then again, the, the next architecture, they just expand on this. Okay, let's, let's uh, I'm gonna pause here. Elvis, any questions? No, I think we're okay. Yeah, we're okay. If anyone has any questions, please let us know. Okay, so, um, so, uh, so with inception, um, we're gonna do the same way. So here there's C1, 2, C4, and these are representing the different conv layers that we're going through, right? Um, so, so one, so one had a single conv layer with a kernel size of one, right? There was another one, the path, the second path had a one by one followed by three by three. And that's what this one is implemented here. And then there was another one, a five by five followed. Uh, there was a one by one followed by another five by five, and that's the one. And then there is the last one, which is the max pooling one. Um, so, so that's straightforward. And then, and then we apply ReLU to them and concatenate the outputs of the output, we, we can kind of connect the, the output channels together, okay? Um, and that's what we see here. So we just can connect, concatenate them. And then the first model uses 64 channels, seven by seven. So this is, um, this is again, if we go back to the book, I believe that they're following one of the previous ones. Um, Oh, actually, they're following. I, I hear they're following. Uh, they're following actually the inception 
here they're, they're, they're probably following the seven by seven. I believe inception, they had an input of 64 and that's what they're doing here. So um, yeah, so th this one is coming from the same as the Google Net, um, uh, the Google Net architecture followed by ReLU. So these are the first block. What's this first block? So we have a con by ReLU and a max layer there. It's it's this one, con max layer and um, uh, con max and, and, uh, and con layer there and so forth. Uh, the second one would be this one before the inception, right? There was another one. There was another one here before the inception, this one. Um, and that's what we have. And then we start now here, we call our inception blocks. And when we specify the, the, the number of channels and channels out, and then we apply max pooling. So now looking at this, it's just things that we've done before. The only difference now is you just, the, the, the input sizes of the channel and the output size of the channel. That's all. And sometimes just let's look at the, the kernel sizes and the stripes and so forth. Um, then we already saw global average pooling. It's also applied here. And then, and then that's, that's really, that's the end of that, uh, of that network. And then here we're checking the number of all sizes and then to apply, of course, we said it's a very deep one. So to apply this, we reduce the, uh, the input height and width from 224. Uh, that was the input, right? Why, where, where did this one come from? It came from because this one was also in ImageNet through through uh, uh, so it's proposed for image net so we just they reduce it in books so 96 so they can uh, they can uh, run it with the fashion MNS and then that's that's what they use for the, the learning rate and so forth okay and here looking at the trend loss and, and so forth it's um hey yeah. Sabine, yeah. sorry to interrupt you there I think your yeah. battery is about to to die. <laughs> I'm seeing. Oh. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> okay, one second. Okay, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, so um, yeah, so maybe here, since we just looked at our loss of the previous one, uh, you can see that this one has definitely a lower loss. Then what was the one that we just seen before this one? It was that network in, net, uh, in network. And you, so it is clear that this one definitely performs better. Okay, uh, I'm gonna maybe talk few things now going back to the slide about, uh, there is the main one, there is what we wanna see is the ResNet with, and that's what I wanna wrap up with. But I also, oh, okay, there's batch norm and then there is the ResNet. B but yeah, um, inception, there are many versions. It is a good architecture. Now, they, then now that we've covered what well, we've covered, we've covered Inception version one. I would encourage you, go and see Inception version two. Actually, Inception version two, the main thing is it added batch norm, which you're gonna see in a second. But now go and see Inception version, version three and, and version four and understand what they're adding and so forth. And then, and then also now pause and think, oh, this is simply, okay, how all these researchers are really thinking through. It's really just that, okay? And then of course, the more practice with it, you can take it both. You can actually be, do it applied. You're gonna be like, you know what, I just want, to build cool things, cool computer vision apps with it. You can do that. You can say, oh, you know what? I'm gonna go and try to beat this benchmarks. You can go and do that. So, so, so you can go either or, but, but, but now you are at that position. Let's talk about special norm. So we talked about dropout and why I said maybe earlier dropout isn't used much because right now batch norm, batch norm is the norm. <laughs> batch norm is usually used um, and you may say, you may, the first thing that, that you may ask, you say, well, we're already using a weight initialization at the, uh, at the beginning. Do we really need to use batch norm? And okay, so, so let's, first, um, let's first explain what batch norm is. So batch norm is simply, you are doing normalization on the whole mini batch of your samples. 
So for example, you are training on thousands of images, you're gonna say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna split that into, I would just say 10 batches that every batch have 100 images. You're gonna do batch norm on those. You're gonna do, for example, for the first layer, you're gonna do the batch norm on that whole mini batch, okay? Um, and, and then and we'll talk about it even a little bit more. And um, and I want to see if there are any other notes that I would like to add there. Okay. So before before moving there, so um, so that's one thing that we may think, okay, weight initialization is enough, but it's even we, even with weight initialization, yes, and it doesn't matter. Weight initialization is very important. Which one you're using? Yes, for example, you probably, if you're using ReLU, you may be using hay initialization. If you're using, uh, depending, depending on which uh, activation function, but, but anyway, it, it is important, but it doesn't fully deal with that vanishing gradient that we talked about. Uh, so batch norm definitely helps with that. And, but these are the intuitions, these are also the challenges of training deep neural networks. Um, the magnitude of the intermediate layers, yes, they can vary. So for example, the output can vary uh, widely between the, between the layers, across the, the layers. And the deeper we get, the 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 network is more susceptible for sure for if, for overfitting so we definitely want some regularization there okay um and this this is another point so talk about regularization definitely regularization is important but you know a lot of time if you do have just a small network if you're just working with a small network most of the time you don't really need to go and do regularization uh, so the, it depending on, and again, consider regularization after, for example, you realize that your model is overfitting, okay? And then be like, okay, uh, so, so those just are things how to go about it. And then this is an example that I took from this paper that uh, this is on one of the most high, high, um, high conv layers that they took and they showed that this is here without batch norm, but of course with batch norm, you can see how it becomes all normalized. Um, and yes, so, so here I've talked, I've talked about, uh, and by the way, I've talked about function gradients. Uh, this, is, this is a good uh, way of, uh, this is actually a good plot here if I want to even before talking about batch norm, batch norm all the way does. You see how like this activation inputs can be, can be ranging widely, but it just normalizes them. So that's what we have on this equation. So we take, uh, we take X, which belongs to that mini batch. So X, X is, um, X, you can, X is a feature in that mini batch minus the mean, the mean of that mini batch. Okay, so I can call it batch or mini batch. Okay, so this is the mean I hear, and that's what we calculated here the mean and the standard deviation. So we subtract the mean, and then if we divide by the standard deviation, doing this makes our results makes our results have a zero mean and a unit variance of one. And then we just simply multiply it here by the scale factor. And then this, um, this beta, this, this offset, this offset um, parameter. So these are two parameters, okay? That we have added. These are, these are parameters, meaning that we, these are also learnable parameters. And you may also, and, and the, 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 you, you may have actually a lot of questions in batch norm and, 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 and that's fine and that's good uh, because you may say, well, why are we doing normalization and then we now we're scaling it and then adding this. Um, actually by doing that, now actually what the means become after, what the mean becomes after, this, after doing this, actually our mean in a way becomes, uh, becomes that. And, um, 
and 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 uh, and we have offset our our normalization and you and and you would want to do this sometimes when would you want to do this for example what if you have done your normalization and maybe it's very squished around zero so maybe if it is very squished around zero maybe you want to scale that up and so forth so there are scenarios so this is and again this allows more flexibility for the network again and when you don't do this that you don't you don't really have control over the mean if you for example if you don't do this because like the mean is all over the mean is an is a result of all uh of all the let's say the the, the features here together but but here you have definitely a lot more control over your mean just by controlling this alpha and and uh, is it is it gamma this one or but yeah, but these two scale and shape parameters. Um, so I hope that that's clear uh, from that side. Um, that's, that's what batch norm is doing. It's doing more normalization, but doing normalization throughout the layers. After every time you get your, you do, for example, your activation, your activation, you do your ReLU or, or that, um, you apply batch norm. Uh, do you apply it before LU or after LU? Uh, actually, yes, some apply it before, some apply it after. And I think I do have a slide of the variation applications of, of, of even batch norm. Um, yeah, so maybe, maybe if I want to add anything here, just as a side note uh, for the vanishing gradients, this is why I said this is good because you can see the derivative. So the dotted here with red is the derivative of this, of this, um, of the sigmoid function, right? So the sigmoid, you can see that when you have, for example, when you have the outputs that are fed into the sigmoid are, for example, high, they're just, they're just bigger than, for example, than, than four and so forth. You can see that uh, the derivative is gonna be leaning almost to zero. So, so, and that's how you actually get your vanishing gradients. Same thing here. If you are getting outputs that are very small, you can see that their derivatives for that, the gradients, that's what the gradients going to be very, uh, very um, uh, lean and almost to zero, you know, and that's vanishing. And then for, um, and then, yeah, so for, for exploding, uh, gradients, you actually, they, they're gonna, they're gonna happen like around here. Why around here? Because you know, not below one and uh, negative one, but actually bigger than one. You see, because this is here between zero and two, and you can think of that. It can they, they can keep growing until they explode. That's pretty much if you just a recap on vanishing and exploding gradients. Um, okay, so um, if I do have, I do actually have a lot of. Uh, I do have some notes about. Uh, batch norm and uh, for example here I said um, batch norm really works with not small uh, for example it wouldn't work for example if you just have one sample in your batch but for a good size would be between 50 and 100 um, and 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 it allows actually the book they say it's, they, it allows for more aggressive learning rates. Um, yeah, let's let's go and do because we only have a few minutes. Let's just go and uh, maybe very quickly go through this. And I want to spend some the last few minutes on resonance because they are super important. And I may go over time for like five minutes, so just. Bear with me, you know, uh, and, uh, and I'm sure resonates. You you will like them. They're uh, they're important, super useful. They are they are what's mostly used even nowadays in computer vision. Okay, so so and I, I'm gonna go skim through this very quick. Again, you have the you you have them you have them on the book. Um, I just want to see if I may have uh, forgot some to mention something. So again, um, use okay. This is actually a good point that I have not mentioned. Uh, whether how batch norm is applied to training and prediction, it is different, right? Because you are during training, you are doing batch norm on 
uh, using the mini batch, using the statistics of the mini batch. Okay, but now let's say you have trained your model for your prediction. Now you have seen your whole data set. So you can actually use the mean and the variance of the whole data sets instead of just many batches, many batches. And that's, and that's why here they keep track of this moving mean. And again, by the way, if you're, if you're gonna be doing this on, on PyTorch and so forth, it's already implemented there for you, but actually them having it from scratch, it's very helpful to go through it. But the point here what I'm saying is, that's what this moving mean is for, is to kind of, to, to keep track of the stats of the overall mean to be used only for the prediction. So anyway, you can go through that. Uh, so this is for prediction else. Else, yes, another point that I may not have mentioned, batch norm is done differently for fully connected layers and, and count layers. Um, but the concept is really, is just the same. It's done differently because the, the number of channels are different. Um, but yeah, okay, that's what they have here. So they have it for either fully connected or they have it for, uh, for kind of layers. And then, and then this, is, this is the main, the main equation where we subtract the mean and then we divide by our standard deviation. And then they just update this moving mean primarily only really for the prediction. Okay, and then the last one is the scale and shift that we saw, and this is the, the gamma, and this is the, the, the beta uh, parameters. And those are, again, learning, those are learnable parameters. And that's it, and that's, that's the main thing. And then the rest here, they're, they're, just, gonna, they're just gonna call it. Um, so there are just some initializations there. Um, and then here to just kind of like uh, specify the devices, GPU and so forth. So please uh, go through this one. I know I've skimmed through it super fast. Uh, the rest here, the rest is just similar to what we've seen before. Um, but please uh, go through this one. And the last thing that I wanna cover now is ResNets. Um, and let's, let's go through the ResNets. And then after ResNet, um, I, I mean, I can stick around. I'll take, I'll take, uh, I'll take, um, I'll, I'll take any questions that you may have any questions. Okay, so ResNet uh, won in uh, 2015, and and I can tell you, I can assure you that first, first one thing. Okay, now you have all this architecture. So which one, which one to use? Um, or do I need to make my own? Or, well, I would say the first thing is don't try to reinvent the wheel, you know? Like there are, for example, there are known architectures to work for specific applications, you know? So for example, if you're doing computer vision, classification, um, nothing, nothing too crazy, you just want a regular, for example, what we want, like a ResNet, you can, for example, I would say, go try a ResNet first, you know? Uh, okay, which we, we're going to see different variants of resonance, maybe with, with, a, with a different depth. Um, but anyway, let's cover resonance. Maybe I can lastly talk about things like that. Um, so what is, what is the motivation behind ResNet? So what the researchers there, they were thinking, they said, okay, we have this model that, for example, this 20, for example, here, what we're seeing here, we have this 20 layer model. That what we're expecting that if we have a deeper model, it should perform the same or even better. Okay? That, that, was, that, was, that, was, their, that was their logic. And it makes sense, right? Uh, if, and that's the thing, that, but, but, but why, but why, but why, uh, but it doesn't. But then what they found, and that's what we see in this. So for example, look at that, look at the train error for, 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 for 20 layer uh, structure and look at that, even the testing error, and you can see that the 56 layer is definitely have a higher. Um, 
and I'm not gonna expand too much on things, but so so the motivation behind that, so a lot of them, they said, oh, the motivation behind ResNet was the vanishing gradients. No, really, actually the vanishing, as, as far as I understand, and I, uh, the, the motivation is that they call it the degradation problem. And it is meaning that your accuracy or whatever actually it saturates at some point. And actually it may even drop after saturation. And that's kind of exactly what, but talk about vanishing gradients. Yes, resonant definitely helps with the residual block with the, with the, the vanishing gradients. Okay, so let's talk what's resonant. So resonance is again, why not even make it deep, but at the same time, it should remain shallow. Meaning it should remain like it can work as shallow if that's the best. If that's the best, like maybe we don't need all the 50 layers, but we have 50, it should still work. And that's kind of what, that's the kind of the idea. So here we can see that we started from this network. Again, uh, if you've been maybe keeping track and, and, uh, and maybe uh, pay t paying too much uh, attention, uh, maybe even more than me, you can look at this kind of like seven by seven conv and this and that you can be like, oh, okay, well, this is, they use this in VGG or, or, or Inception or because, because they all, for example, used different kernel sizes, especially for the first conv layers and so forth. So that's how we say, you know, that's how, for example, this one, I'm guessing this is probably uh, either AlexNet or VGG. Um, Probably Alex said. But anyway, the point here is we're trying to make it deep. So we've added, we've added all these layers. Okay, we've added all these layers. But now we still want this to perform better than this in all scenarios, which is not the case. So what they said, why not add this identity mappings? They call them identity mapping, or you can call them a skip connection, an identity connection, wherever you would you would like to call it. But that was the idea. And by adding these, by adding these, meaning like your network when it's back propagating, it can actually, it can actually in a way go through this. And when I say it can in a way go through this and skip this, what does that mean? That means really it's just setting the weights of this FFX to zero in a way. That, what does that mean then? It's just gonna kind of like be, be that. Look at this one, uh, H of X is f of x plus x. If f of x is zero, h of x will be just x. And that's how we would have just kind of skipped a bunch of layers by just making their weights zero. Okay, that, so that was the whole idea here. And why it's called residual because what we are trying to learn is the thing is this f of x which is a residual, meaning if meaning we have to kind of we have to um, we have to add it to x we have to add a residual to x to make it match our output because that's the goal the goal is for us for what's our goal what we're, what's our always objective our object, objective is kind of like for x to be equal to h of x so um okay so that that's the idea um let's talk now how how they made that happen so it's just the same but uh, maybe on the last one, it was just an overall block. Here, it's more detailed. So you have that 101 uh, conv. Uh, why do you have a 101 conv here? The 101, the 101, so there, there are two, well, there are two versions. There is one like this and one like this, one without. The one like this one is just the one that we just seen. You have the identity going like this and all that. And it's fine, but here one thing to mention is like, because you're adding them, you definitely wanna make sure that the, the input sizes are the same. The one, the input size that's coming from this arrow and the input size that's coming from this arrow are the same. Sometimes they are not, right? Because we may have applied max pooling or something. And that's where this 101, uh, one by one count comes. So maybe if, uh, if, if it's going through this, and it will have a different size here. We're gonna use this one by one to kind of like change the, the, the size of X to make it the same. And then we can, um, 
we can just add them together. And so this, the residual black hole, we're trying to learn, we're trying to learn the weights that are inside here. And that's, that's, pretty, much, that's pretty much all that there is there. Um, we've already seen Conv, we've already seen Batch Norm, Batch Norman, uh, again, the layers here based on the many batches we have, we apply real U, we apply three by three kernel Conv, and then again, Batch Norm. So again, two variations depending on if the input size, that's why we have this. Okay. These are, I just added this to just kind of know, okay, do I want to put batch norm before, um, well, these are just variants of residual blocks, okay? And the original one is just the one that we saw. And it is like that, you have the conv layer, uh, batch norm is applied after it's really you, uh, conv layer, batch norm, and then um, you add them and then you apply again your radio activation. There are different variations and I will leave this um, for you to, to, to explore. And, uh, and, and that's why sometimes you would find some people, they say, no, you, okay, use batch norm before or after real you and so forth. Um, yeah, so, um, so with that being said, and, and all the difference between this is where the addition sometimes is placed. So for example, you can see that the addition here is placed before batch norm and, and, and so forth. So moving, moving on, this is maybe before the last slide. And maybe if I am just rushing a bit, just because maybe of the fellows who, who needs to, to leave, but, uh, but we, we are approaching the end. The book, our book, have it like this. And you may look at it and you may say, okay, um, maybe not, not, not too clear, right? But here, I, this is the same. I just, I just liked this one. I said, this can be a better representation. So, but these are the same. So what are they doing here? You can look at the seven. They're both starting with seven by seven kernel. You're going through them uh, three by three max, okay? So here, now we're gonna get into our ResNet blocks. Okay, so follow with me now here. So now we come, we have this ResNet block that has the three by three and then, and then by the way, here we do have some that we may have real U and batch norm that maybe we do not see here. But what I wanna hear say one thing, look at this solid lines and look at this dotted lines. The solid lines is when we simply just use this one, the straight one, okay? This straight one. And that's what we have, and that's what we've used here. And that's, you can see here, we just use this one. But here we've used this dotted line, and why? Because you can see that the shape, the input, the output channels has just changed from 64 to 128. So for us to be able to actually have the residual block kind of working, we just use the other one, which has the one by one conf. And that's all that there is. So we just use it here and then we go back to our solid line. And then when it changes between 128 and 256, that's where we wanna just use it. That's how here they have it here repeated three times, okay? Um, and, that's, and that's pretty much what this ResNet, so actually the paper, the paper presented a few different versions of ResNet. They presented, I believe, uh, ResNet 18, ResNet 32, I believe ResNet 52 or 51. But again, the number, it just re represents how many layers deep it went. But really the, the, the logic is just the same, okay? Um, did this prove to be helpful? Certainly, actually it's, it's a ResNet and as you saw earlier, and maybe we should go back, but anyways, we should go back to that, uh, to, to that plot, ResNet won the, the 2015 competition. And even till now, a lot of actually architecture, they still use these skip connections. You, are, you often find these skip connections used. And um, so that was helpful, where that was helpful to even help with these vanishing gradients that now, that now when we propagate back this, we can propagate back the gradients and they will not, for example, vanish or they will not explode. Um, to, to just wrap up, so um, if we compare that plain one, the plain one that did not have any of those skip connections. So this is plain. So this is 18 layers, plain. 34, plain, no skip connections here. This is, for example, what we got from ImageNet. 
top one error. By the way, I did not mention this, but uh, it's helpful to maybe you will cross this. Sometimes ImageNet was uh, the benchmark was measured into using like two types of error, top one error and top five error. Top one error is just like measuring, let's say the accuracy on that, on the, the right thing, the one thing that you're trying to get, okay? Did you get the right class or not? The top five, it's like, was your prediction part of, um, uh, was your, um, uh, was your prediction top of on the of was your prediction from the top five ones? Okay, uh, let, let me put it in a better way. So top five error. Um, yeah, so top five error meaning is was your prediction from the top five? Um, and anyway, you can look that up. Uh, but I just want to mention that there were two types of errors, and you can see comparing plain versus ResNet. Uh, for 18 layers, yes, it slightly did better, but you can see how when now we went deep, it certainly did a lot better, okay? And again, it's 25, but uh, earlier we saw smaller values because those were using the other error, which is the top five error, okay? Um, again, was this one is showing this is same one here with the plane. You see like how, but now when we do with ResNets, if we especially look at the 34 layer, the red one, we can see that the error is lower compared to that one. And then, and that's what, and these are taken from the paper of, of ResNets. And this is the last slide uh, maybe that I have is just the difference. So based on that, there are just different variants of ResNets and what's, what's What's different between them is just the number of, of, uh, of the depth, pretty much. Um, how deep and, and how many uh, residual blocks that they're using. And that's what, what you can see. So for example, the one that we just covered, they use two here, two, um, uh, two residual blocks here, and then others and others would like have three and, and, and so forth. Uh, for example, here, like, let's say the big ones, the 101 ResNet. So this uh, would be a ResNet 101, 23 here versus the one that we just saw our fourth conv layer here only had, um, here only had two. Well, this again, this is not the fourth conv layer. This one, it had two conv layers of that and that. And then here it had 23 total conv layers. And then here, this is the last one that's showing the, the 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 performance on the ImageNet from the VGG, Google Net, and so forth, and how ResNet really performed a lot better. And that's why I said it was those smaller ones were on the top five error, how it performed a lot better, even from VGG, which was much better than AlexNet, which were also now going back much better than the shallow networks that they were ma manually engineered, mostly SVNs and so forth. So with that, I had uh, ResNet, uh, we were gonna go through that, but I believe it is very the same as, um, as uh, what we've looked already. The only thing here to look at in ResNet, please, when you look at the book, just look at the implementation of that residual block. Uh, I have just, okay, you can see that I am approaching the end. The last thing that I wanna mention, um, that's it. This is the end. So we've covered by, by now, but at this point, I can claim that you have followed with me all these different architectures. You've seen so many different blocks. You can see how one builds on the previous one. And what are the things that researchers and other practitioners are changing? It can be as simple as, it can be as simple as the number of strides, as simple as the number of kernel size, it can be more to even what, what is it inside the block. It can even be different combinations, but you get, you, you get, and that's all. Once you have that, anything now that comes is really just building in all this together. You even seen how a one by one conf can really, we talked about compute again, always remember, like right now, right now, okay, right now, what's hot in, in all this? What's hot are, are this efficient net. 
and what are these efficient net? This efficient net, what they're really trying to do, they are just trying to be efficient, as the name says it, efficient network, meaning they're trying to actually have a smaller network, somehow a smaller network, but really keep the accuracy the same or even better. Okay, so there are again more tweaks on that, but that's pretty much. But that's pretty much all there is. And the book here, they also add dense net, and and uh, and and uh, they're also very popular. And what dense net are simply is, you feed the output of a layer not to only the one that's following it. You see how we usually we only feed it to the one that's following it. So these again, they also built from the skip connections. But instead, they're saying, okay, well, instead of just skipping just a few layers, how about we just feed, uh, the, feed the output to all the layers above? And that's why it is called dense, because it's kind of like it's feeding this. You can see how this, for example, the red arrows are going as an output to, the, to this conv uh, layers here, but they're also going as inputs as these and so forth. And this is what dense uh, net is really. Um, with that, and the book, of course, the book has um, has the code for that. Um, please go go or go through it. Uh, what we have covered, you definitely will not see anything new. Again, what's going to be new is that there is just one thing that's added on everyone. Is for example, for this one, what's added the feeding of this connection into the next ones. And lastly, as there were the other ones, there are different variants depending on how deep is the network. Um, these, so, so, these, so this is here uh, for, uh, for the, the accuracy. So these are just different ones that they're showing here the accuracy, which one have the highest accuracy and we're starting from. Alex, uh, AlexNet, um, uh, I mean, back in AlexNet, it performed everything. It was the best, but of course, comparing it to ResNet when it came and so forth, of course it's not. And then here on the X axis is how big is your model really? Uh, and then here when we talk how big, again, one thing, please remember, when we say how big is your model, a model that is very deep, does not necessarily mean that model have a lot of parameters and a lot of operations, not necessarily, okay? Um, okay, so, um, and this is what we see here. Here we see how big, meaning like really how, uh, and how big here is usually related how much compute that really does the network really need. And, uh, and with this, you can see that how ResNets are really inceptions uh, where are still, uh, we, can, we can certainly say, still say um, they are still state of the art. Right now, transformers are also coming to vision. There's another story, but we can still say as of now, uh, ResNets are, um, are still states of the art in a way. And, and, and if you are familiar with ResNet, and this is just off, and somebody is maybe you got an interview or just you're just talking and somebody's like, what are you using as, a, as your architecture? And you say, I'm using ResNet and this, it is fine. You're not using anything outdated, even if it was uh, 2015 and so forth, it's still performing well. Um, and and that's, that's all, um, I, there is another, there is another uh, chapter about computer vision. I believe it's chapter 13. And, um, and I believe right now we are at our point, I would say two things. We are at a point where, where you are certainly ready to go scrape a data set and build at least a classification, find a way how you can label it let's say now you have labeled it, or maybe, you know what, instead of scraping it, just find one that's go to maybe Kaggle. Kaggle have so many already labeled. Pick one and just say, you know what, I'm gonna try ResNet on it, or I'm gonna just do that on it. You are definitely ready for that. Uh, another thing you can do, if you still have any doubts about this, 
or not even doubts. So right now you are at a level where you can even start writing maybe like blogs to even share, express your, uh, um, you know, you, you, you have a good understanding of how architectures are put together. So if you want to do that, that's also, but I, what I would say, what I would say, go and get your hands dirty and just, and just be like, oh, this is confusing. Why I'm getting this shape, I'm getting that. That's, but first, of course, go again over what we talked about today make sure that you understand it all and i think we are at a good step on when the chapter of the computer vision when we can talk about maybe what are the the recent actual applications if we for example if we're going to talk about facial emotion recognition what are so for example this is good what we've seen is good but now when we target specific applications we base on CNNs, but we use different architectures. You may have heard maybe of an encoder decoder architecture or maybe uh, different ones. We are ready now to go into that. But, we, but you don't need to wait right now. You are ready to go and tackle some data sets. And that's what I would suggest. And let's, if you have any questions, I'll take them now. Elvis? I'm just waiting to see if there's any questions. Any questions, let me know. Um, otherwise, thanks Salim for doing this. This is absolutely awesome. Very, very, um, I would say very extensive. <laughs> yeah, very extensive summary of all the latest developments in CNNs. So I think this is really, really helpful. I, I, like you said, um, once you know how to put them together, put those blocks together, um, you can go and try your data sets and just experiment with different architectures. That's that's the way to go. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, and, and again, if I can add anything, um, Elvis, and, and to all of you, and just put something on GitHub, you know, just from now, from now, just, and that's the best way. And don't think of... Uh, if people will look at it, or, but just have something working, uh, put it on GitHub. And again, I think we talked about Streamlit. If you want to even take it to that and make an app from it, that's fine. If you just want to, okay, I'm done with that data set. I'm going to go to a different data set. Do that. I would say just try different ones. Absolutely. You're right, Elvis. Just. Yeah. Um, and, and I think someone, I think it would be nice to, you know, maybe offer an assignment here. Maybe what would be nice is to maybe propose a data set or maybe propose a few data sets to people from Kaggle, something that's accessible really easily. And then we can you know, ask people to apply just to put a little bit of, <laughs> of making, making some accountability thing would be nice. Um, and we could put it an assignment, you, know, you don't really need to make anything fancy, but just, just have some, some results and, and try to adopt like the same style that the book uses. So I think that would be great as an exercise. It's, that's a good idea mm -hmm. that we can definitely do that. Okay, we will do that and then we'll give a, a couple of maybe two weeks and I think that would be a lot of fun. And like you said, I think it's nice if we put it on, on GitHub. And um, so when you do a submission, put it on GitHub and you have something to show that you have, you know how to apply these things. Yeah. That would be great. And that would also make me happy to see that, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. If there aren't anything, if there is anything, please post it on Slack. I will definitely check, uh, check it, you know. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank, Thank you, Salim. Thank you very much for doing it again. This was really awesome. Thank you. Take care. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Bye.